Lila Smith, welcome to the Marketing Study Lab podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I've never been interviewed by a Lego master before, so this is the first. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to clarify, Lego master of marketing. I'm not a Lego master, unfortunately. Uh, love the stuff, love the brand, think it's an amazing thing, and hence the, the tagline. But yeah, unfortunately, I'm not an actual Lego master. I just wanted to clarify that for any Lego masters that are actually listening, because they'd probably take offense. Is that a real thing? Yeah, it are is. Are there actual Lego masters? Is that a real title? Do you have to yeah. test to get that title or something? I'm not sure how you get it. By Lego master, they, they, they build things out of Lego. So that's how you become a Lego master. You, you build all these elaborate things that aren't in kits, if you like. So if you go to Legoland or if you go to a Lego store and you see something of Harry Potter or Hagrid or whoever, probably a Lego master has, has yeah. created that. Like they made a custom kit to create this vision out of the bricks that they had. Yeah. Same Legos that anybody else had, but for a completely different result. Well, now yeah. I get why you're the Lego master of marketing, because that's exactly what you do with marketing, right? You create these custom plans and custom bricks and custom or, or ever, the same bricks that everybody has, but it's the way that you choose to help other people use them to achieve their vision and their goals. That's exactly why I've invited you on today <laughs> for, that, <laughs> for that kind of praise. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 absolutely. So I, I just want to, before we get started, and this is, this is completely left field for, for me to do this kind of intro, I'm, I'm not going to introduce you myself because I like my guests to do that because no one knows you better than you. But what I will say is that Lila is probably the nicest, one of the nicest people in the world and the nicest person online. Um, so I'm really looking ah. forward to this. <laughs> Thank you. I'll have to be nice then. <laughs> True. So yeah, yeah, yeah. People, yeah. people do say that. They say I'm a nice person. Like, you know how they say, how you just said, nobody knows you better than you know yourself. Like, I don't think I'm that nice of a person. I just limit the people that I interact with to the people I really like. <laughs> so it's very easy for me to be nice to you, <laughs> to be interested in you or to remember what you do or articulate mm -hmm. it. Cause I find you interesting, talented, and fun. So I like you, I admire you. And so of course I'm nice to you. <laughs> I, am, I'm, I make it really easy for myself to be seen that way, you know, <laughs> just from I love that. who I choose to surround myself with. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. Everyone dropping value already. Fantastic. Everyone can <laughs> learn from that straight away. I love it. Uh, yeah, but, if you want to be seen as a nice person, make sure that you're surrounded by people you want to be nice to. Yeah, yeah, that is very true. And why, why wouldn't you? But in, in some walks of life, that's, that's harder than, than others, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting away without a random opener. Okay. So, Random opener this time is, and I suppose this will be, as it usually is, it'll become apparent why I'm asking this in your intro. Uh, what is your favorite line from a musical? Look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. Look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. Uh, I mean, it to me sums up what creativity is and how creativity belongs to everyone not just artists, not just a painter in the park, uh, you know, which is part of this musical. It's not just, it's not just that a hat was painted onto a person. It's that the artist chose to create this moment, to mm -hmm. create this little hat where there wasn't a hat before. Even on the person in front of him whose portrait he was painting, there wasn't a hat, but he decided that a hat would make this, this picture in his vision even more real than reality. I think it's astonishing just to think about that. Look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. What musical is that from? I'm, I'm trying to think and I can't. I think it's from Sunday in the Park. Okay. With George. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to look it up, but I, I remember it's Sondheim for sure. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I love the fact that, like you say, it, it wasn't there and to have that vision to put something there. And that's, that's what I suppose life's all about. And that's, that's why we do the work we do to make people's yeah. lives better and to create things that aren't there already. Yeah. And to acknowledge our own creativity. 
Hmm. I'm sure as a marketing professional, you've heard so many people, the ones who come to you saying, I need help with this because I'm not creative, yep. you know, or our team is really great at executing, but they don't have the creative vision. Uh, and so creative vision and creativity, I think are two different things. Mm -hmm. like being able to see what the end product is, is a result um, or, or something that you want to move towards. Creative vision is not something that everybody has, but I think creativity is. It's okay. that instinct. Mm -hmm even if you can't picture what you want the painting to look like when you're done, you can decide, I think there should be a hat there. <laughs> yeah. And you can only make that decision because of your whole history of seeing hats versus no hats in your whole life. <laughs> that, is, that belongs that is to true. you. Yeah, yeah. Those instincts belong to you. And anyone that says there isn't creative, then just, <laughs> I don't want to bring this all back to Lego, but just, just buy a small bag of Lego <laughs> and start playing with it. And whatever you create, you'll create something that is creative. It almost forces exactly. you to do that. Right. Mm. Or to take a look at your own day. I bet everybody listening right now, if you think back towards the minutes or hours in your day that have happened already up until this very moment, and you ask yourself, where did I make a hat where there never was a hat? <laughs> where, did I, where did I create something that wasn't there before? Where did I... Um, Maybe it's a solution. It's a, a problem you solved. Maybe you wrote an email. You put words out there into the universe that were never there before. Mm -hmm. Maybe you put a smile on someone's face where their face was expressionless before. Look, I made a hat. Where there never was a hat, I made a hat. In that moment, it was missing this, I added it. And just give yourself that moment of recognition mm -hmm. that you have created today. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. So I just want to take a step back first and foremost and put the, the hat where there never was a hat and, and why the musical uh, link is, is there and put it in some context. So tell us a bit about your background and, and what's the story that brings you to this stage in your career and what are you up to now? So I was a theater actress, which is why Peter has asked me about what's my favorite line from a musical. And it's by far my favorite line, although there are many other excellent lines mm -hmm. from musicals. I was in musical theater and in Shakespeare and other plays in New York City and around the United States on several national tours of shows. And I always had that theater thing in me. I mean, this is my personality. If you're even just listening and not watching any video of this, you can probably hear kind of what I'm like. And now imagine that I grew up, you know, in the 80s with parents in New York City who were very progressive and they're like, what do I do with this kid? I, I, I have to do something in New York. You put them in theater. <laughs> That's what they did. So I learned a lot of really cool things. I, I learned storytelling and acting things out and creating something very real in fiction, using my imagination and ultimately a lot of communication tools, which are what I use now. Mm. So tools that actors that use on stage or in rehearsals to bring that truth to fictional circumstances. I'm now helping people with in real life, bring that same truth to real circumstances, nonfiction, real life, off stage, the good stuff. And that's what I do. I help people communicate better. Uh, my program and company are called say things better. Hmm. And that also means listen better too. Mm -hmm. part of it. Sometimes saying things better means not saying things. <laughs> so that's what I do, uh, where I came from and, and what I do now. Uh, the other part of me that I'll share with this audience is that a lot of actors need a day job, you know, a way to earn money because the arts don't pay the way that they should for the value that's created, but that's mm. another conversation. <laughs> My day job was in e-commerce. So okay. I actually had a full corporate career in, in leadership, in management, in branding, marketing, and ultimately e-commerce uh, department leadership. So I was the director of a uh, department for e-commerce for a footwear company as my last full-time corporate job before I left to go full-time on my own. So my communication stuff that I learned in theater, I was applying not only to the leadership of my department, but to the marketing projects that we were undertaking, um, tracking, testing, and really understanding characters, the character of our company. What did we want to tell about our, ourselves? The characters of our email openers or of our customers, what stories could they see themselves in? 
So to me, it's always kind of been part of this one giant storytelling experiment that is mm-hmm. my life. That's a brilliant way to look at life. And, and j- just, to, just to take a, a step back in, into that story, it, it's a fantastic backstory. But if you look at where you are now and, and how you've got that, I don't know. Well, I'll say anyone. I certainly don't know anyone, but I don't know anyone with those two types of backgrounds that can offer what you offer and provide from those two areas of expertise, what you provide, which is why you're on today and, and cool. why I find it so interesting about what you do. Cause it makes just so much sense. Almost, almost, you know, people talk about things being aligned and, and your life being aligned yes. and, it, and yes. it's almost like your life has been aligned. So you had to do the theater, you had to do the e-commerce to get to your knowledge base of what you know now. So you can teach people it. Yeah. If I look back at my life, I see, you know, theater is the the blue Lego and then e-commerce as the red Lego, but they have to fit together, mm-hmm. you know, plus this one other thing, the, this, this white Lego, if you want to make either of our country's flags. So we need, <laughs> you know, we need these different things together to, to create a result. But going through it in my life, I did not feel aligned. Mm-hmm. I felt like I'm either a blue Lego or a red Lego and I have to pick. Mm-hmm. I have to pick which one I am. And it didn't occur to me until other people started coming to me. And this especially happened on LinkedIn. I found that platform. This is kind of the how-to of what happened to me. I found that the platform was no longer a place for just putting up a resume and writing recommendations for people you worked with, but it was really becoming this content platform and a community where entire groups of people formed where there never were groups of people before. So many hats, (laughs) Uh, so many hats being created where there never were hats. These people from all over the world. You and I met through someone that Mm -hmm. I met on LinkedIn. And, you know, we, we have come together on this platform because I think it's a safe space to share ideas, creativity, learning, leadership, growth, Mm -hmm. the things that help people professionally to move forward. And it's really unlike any other platform in that way. Mm -hmm. So far, when I came onto the platform, people were already there with the intention to grow themselves, to support other people's growth, and to recognize and leverage professional value in others. So by simply showing up and letting my voice be heard through comments on other people's posts, through messages I would send in the DMs, the direct messages, and through posts that I would put up of my own, I was putting stuff out there. I was communicating with whatever I chose to share. Mm -hmm. But it, it was other people coming and seeing that and then responding and reflecting back to me, you're a good communicator. I don't know what it is about you, but you always just somehow say things better. <laughs> Can you help me? I'll pay you to do this. <laughs> Can you help me with? And that's when I started seeing when it kept happening over and over again, other people are seeing value. They were already seeing the full flag. They're already mm-hmm. seeing the hat that I didn't know I was wearing. I was just showing up and being there. My audience on LinkedIn my community, my connections. These were the people who said to me, you have something special. It's interesting because you said this thing about e-commerce on this one post. And then you're saying this thing about how you played a matzo ball at St. Luke's theater, you know, on this other post. But did you know that those are connected? And I was Mm. like, no, those are the two very different parts of my life. And in fact, when I started on LinkedIn, I didn't talk about my theater experience at all. I was so afraid that people would discredit the stuff I was saying about marketing because they would think I was some floofy actress who's frivolous and, you know, likes to color with crayons and play make-believe because that is my experience from a lot of people who don't know what acting really is. Mm -hmm. So I shut that out completely, but it was when I started revealing it in little tiny comments, just testing it out. Oh, will they run away? Will they still like me? If I just mention this one little thing, in a comment, not even in a post. That's when people started showing me that I had been overlooking my own value the whole time. Hmm. These I think a parts lot of, people, of me were not separate. They were together. I think a lot of people will resonate with that and, and hopefully it gets them thinking, okay, so I do this thing or, or I don't talk about that thing or um, I'm really interested in this, but this is my day job. And 
I, yeah. the, the one thing that is highlighted there is, is every, not everybody, but most people fall into that. I'm defined by what I do and you are, but you can change that. You're not, you, you should never be defined by what you do right now. If you're not happy with that definition, because it, it's in your power to change it. Yeah. I think if you do that exercise we talked about before, where you go back through even just today mm. and you ask yourself, what did I make today where there wasn't something before? What did I make happen? What did I cause to be? And then ask yourself another question, a creative question. Um, one, like, am I excited about this? Do I like the hat? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, d- is this a good thing? Uh, yes or no. If I get the chance to do the same thing tomorrow, would I, would I be happy about that? Yes or no. Mm-hmm. So simple, right? But we don't question our experience. We just kind of float through it and then feel the overwhelm of it. Yeah. But if you stop and, and you bring yourself present in that moment and just ask yourself, do I like this? Yes or no. Then you can ask another question. Okay. I do like this. Why do I like this? Why did I feel that that hat needed to be there where there never was a hat? What was missing that I felt the hat added? And then you start to see the value of your own vision, the value of your own contribution. I saw that something could work more smoothly. I saw that something didn't have to be so complicated. Hmm. I saw that something could be easier to teach. I saw that there's a better word for that. I saw that a different color might elicit a different response in someone. I like things to be neat. I like things to be off-centered. And so if you ask yourself what it was about your decision that gave you a happy face or an unhappy face Mm -hmm. uh, when you you rate that response, you'll start to see that you are the same person in your day job, in your side jobs, in your hobbies, in your personal life. You're always going to be finding, like when when you're rating something with a happy face or an unhappy face, and you look at the happy faces, those happy faces are the same in everything that you do. Mm. I'm happy when I'm communicating. I'm happy when I'm connecting. I'm happy when I'm uh, leading. I'm happy when I am facilitating. I'm happy interacting with a lot of people. And that's me. Other people might hear those things and say, no, 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 no. <laughs> not that, not for me. Oh, great. That's great awareness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to be that person everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. You don't just have to, you don't have to be a different person at work. You don't if if that isn't you, it isn't you. You know, you need to be true to yourself and and there's loads of caveats with that and yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what I'd like to do and and you're doing it already, which is fantastic, but th- this whole podcast is about communicating effectively and there's no better person to talk to about communication than yourself, Lila. So thank you. First and foremost, talk us through your Say Things Better methodology. What's what's that all about? It's a bunch of tools that I use in theater that if you apply them off stage in your real life and you you bring more awareness to what you're doing and when you're communicating with other people, the way that actors bring their awareness to how they're communicating with the other actor on stage whether or not they are or aren't serving their character and their story, you'll find that all of your relationships are deeper, that people really feel that you were there for them and with them in every conversation. You will feel more confident, organized, clear about what you want to say, and you can measure whether or not you've done it Mm -hmm. so that you know, yeah, I did my best communicating in this scenario. And then you can let it go and move on to the next opportunity to do your best. But it's really about asking yourself, what do I want to say or how do I want to listen? And then how can I do that better? So these steps are my offering for how people can say things better. It starts with just knowing who you are, what's important to you. So I I used to use this as the fifth step, but I've just recently moved it to the first. It's called verb your values. And verb your values brings your attention to this, the thing that you're doing as you're communicating with someone. Okay. And if it's important to you to affirm someone and you just ask yourself, am I, am I doing that? Am I affirming this person? It might cause you to stop and let them talk more. It might cause you to reflect back to them. Here's the value I heard in what you said. It might cause you to take note of more things you can compliment in someone. 
And not everybody wants to be affirmed, but if it's true to you that that's really important to you, then you get to see this is the value that I provide. That is, mm. that is my favorite way to show up. And some people are going to really like that about me. That's basically your personal brand, what it feels like to communicate with you no matter what you're saying. Mm -hmm. so that comes first. And then your motivation is this thing that if you're an actor, you're trying to find what is, what is my, um, what's my motivation to cross the stage? <laughs> what's my motivation to say this line? Why would I bother opening my mouth and letting these words out? It has to achieve something. And in each scene, you have an objective, which is what comes next. But the motivation is really for your whole life, what's at stake for you if you do or don't pay attention to how you're communicating. So for some people, that's, I want to be a good provider for my family. That's, I mean, that's what it is for me. I don't even mm -hmm. have a family yet, you know, but I imagine my future foster children uh, who will be teenagers or, you know, or older kids that I want to adopt. And, and what do I, what do I want to be able to provide for them? And then taking it a step further in my workshops, I help people to tell a story that they can then envision so that they can recall it as though it were true. Some people call it visualization, you know, or manifestation or whatever. I just call it your motivation. When you're not motivated to get out of bed, to do the work, to go through the hard stuff, when you're not motivated to be your highest self in communication with somebody who's bothering you or attacking you or is a troll or uh, is your boss and uh, doesn't see your value, it can be really hard to rise above. Mm -hmm. And having a motivating story that you can envision really helps with that. So that's the second part. And then it's your objective. What do I want to get a yes on for this one communication event? If I send an email, what am I hoping people will do? You know, this audience probably thinks of it as call to action. Mm -hmm. What do you want people to do as a result of this communication? What do you need in order to feel like this was a win for you? So maybe you want them to click on something. Maybe you want them to agree to let you uh, attend a party. Maybe you, you know, whatever your yes is, you want to get specific. I want a verbal confirmation yeah. that yes, you're willing to sit in the exit row, <laughs> uh, you know, on an airplane. I want a, uh, a click in an email. What is the specific action so that you can measure whether or not it actually happened? And then the next step is your audience's objective. The person you're communicating with, what do they want? What do they want? Why are they still here? Why haven't they walked off stage? Hmm. I've been in rehearsals before where the way that we all trained served, served this moment. So just in case it sounds terrible to anyone, just so you know, this was a norm. We expected this and it was our creative job to make sure that people didn't walk out. But we would have rehearsals of scenes where if we were not compelling, if we were not giving that other character on stage enough of a reason to stay and listen to what we had to say, the other actor playing that other character would walk off stage and leave us there. And then we would know we did not compel them to stay. We did not consider uh, what they needed in that moment. So what is it that's stopping people your audience from deleting your email? Mm -hmm. What's stopping them from scrolling past your social media post? What's stopping people, if you're, let's say you're even making a cold call, which no one should be doing anymore, you know, but if you are, if you're making a totally cold call and someone on the other end has not hung up the phone yet, it tells you that there's still a chance yeah. and that they have some objective you could be finding. And so that's that next step is finding the reason why someone will stay and consider it a win for them. And so that's really, that's really, you have, you have to go into your toolbox next to see what do you have to stop them from, from walking off stage. But mm -hmm. once you know what those needs are, it's easy to line them up with the solutions you provide. That's everything. It's, it's aligning the intent and the content of what you say. It, it, the, the one thing that, that I took away from there is, is uh, you, as you were describing that, that theater example is that you, you could do that for, for and, and you did link it there but you could do that for all your comms and I always say to people this this piece of communication this email this uh, sponsored post this whatever it is it's not going to change anyone fund I mean it might be it depends how powerful it is but it's never going to take right. everybody from I just know your company I've just realized what you do to I'm going to buy from you 
is like, what's that one action point you want? Is it just a awareness piece? And that's done that. And what's the next bit? What's that next call, call to action, that next touch point? Because everything should have one fundamental action. And if you take that to the theater example, it's, like, it's almost right. Okay, if, if you walked around with this sponsored post and said, that interested to you and they just walked off without saying anything there's your answer we do it on a daily basis with posts with emails like you were saying but because it's a a distance away because it's through electronic media or whatever it is and it's it's in the distance we just don't pay attention to it enough as we should do and we miss a trick i feel we're in a digital world now you and i are meeting digitally Mm -hmm. this is a digital (laughs) electronic moment yeah People listening to this are receiving it digitally and we've already recorded it, you know, but by the time they're receiving my communication and yours, there's been time that's passed. There's Mm -hmm. physical distance. There's what we experience as digital distance, but the information is reaching them right now. So it's up to us to imagine who are they in that moment? Who are they in general, but also who are they in that moment? Why did they decide to listen to this episode this morning? Mm -hmm. If you and I are thinking ahead about how we can pack this with value for those people, we're thinking of all of the episodes that you have. This audience member has chosen to listen to this episode about communication. Mm -hmm. Why? Why, I mean, why did you bring in a communication person? Yeah. Well, what did you, what, what kind of value did you think it would provide? So I think other than everything we've already previously discussed in terms of your excellent, (laughs) what you do and offer and all that kind of stuff, uh, the reason is, is, is because I think it's one of those fundamental pieces that's missing because my, my whole um, premise in life is to show companies um, how a marketing orientated approach can benefit them for the long term. And the issue we have in marketing nowadays is the fact that people see us as communicators with a communications department. We're not the marketing department. And I won't get into that rabbit hole, but the reason that I wanted to bring you on is because um, you put it in an eloquent manner. You understand it from a wider perspective and you can see it from the customer's point of view of which very few marketers do They like to think they do but Mm -hmm. they're blindsided for working for an organization that their organization is worth listening to when no one wants to listen to them. So that moment, if we, if we just give your listeners the value that solves that problem, Mm -hmm. right? Like nobody wants to listen to our organization. And if we can solve that problem with this one episode, it'll be one of the most forwarded episodes or downloaded episodes that you have, which will tell you, This gave exactly the value that you wanted to to your audience. So let's do it. Let's think about organizations that feel nobody wants to listen to what their value is. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you a very simple um, tool from theater. It's called in in playwriting, the inciting incident. Okay. It's that thing that happens in a story that causes everything to crumble (laughs) for the main character or that causes a major shift. Everything was fine until this inciting incident. Okay. And then came the, the, in, in, if it's easier, you know, in marketing language, if you just think about the straw that broke the camel's back for your last client, and you really think about that moment right before they called Peter something Lego master of marketing, Mm -hmm. what happened that day right before they sent that email to you saying i'm ready mm-hmm. what ha- what was that straw that broke the camel's back what was their inciting incident that stopped them in their tracks and said no more of this i'm ready to pay <laughs> or no more of this like i know I, I know i'm ready to listen now and that straw is the story that you want to start thinking about telling through content and there can be lots of different straws so if you mm. create content or sh- share emails that are stories about that straw the more specific it is the more people can put themselves into that story as the sort of the hero of that story and imagine it happening to them so let's say it's your your company provides um provides value by um i mean i don't know give me give me any example of, of a company that okay so might feel not not listen to Sure. So let's let's go with because I've just been talking about it uh, today. So mm-hmm. let let's let's talk about a um, a company that does 
uh, distribution. So I'm talking, you know, like FedEx, UPS, that kind of thing, but it's a great. smaller Perfect. localized one. That's great. Um, what would be the reason to use a smaller localized distributor instead of a major national or international brand? Uh, um, I don't know now. <laughs> no. Uh, so. Well, let's think about that, right? Like you're, you can't compete on price. Yeah. You know that. Mm -hmm. But where can you compete? Where are you better? And you have to find that better thing and then think of the story that's the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have this better thing, this terrible thing happened. <laughs> this was the straw that broke the camel's back when I said, forget it, I'm not working with UPS anymore. I'm not working with um, British Post or USPS or FedEx. I need someone who will take my phone calls. Mm -hmm. And so if you can imagine that day for your client and tell that story, all of your other future clients will be like, that's happened to me, or that could very well happen to me, or, mm -hmm. oh no, that had better never happened to me. And so that storytelling about that moment, it could be, and I'll, I'll tell a story, you know, at DNA Footwear, we had, um, it was the Christmas holiday, uh, Hanukkah and end of year, we had sales, we had promos, everybody was placing orders and shipping shoes, a tremendous amount of volume of stuff went out. And we needed to be able to fulfill our orders in time. But because our shipping service, which I don't remember if it was UPS or USPS, the United States Postal Service at the time, it was one of the major organizations. We couldn't get anybody on the phone when our driver was late. We didn't have anybody coming to us. It was you know, an hour and a half past the office closing time which also makes it unsafe in an area of Brooklyn that had not been completely renewed. Uh, and I was there by myself in the office to make sure that I waited for the one postal service person <laughs> to come and take all of our packages away. They didn't have enough space in their trucks because they hadn't had, you know, from their corporate oversight, enough support. <laughs> so they didn't, they had one same truck. They didn't send three or four trucks at a time so he was full and couldn't take all of our packages. And that meant that we missed deadlines and that meant that we had a huge loss financially of all of the things that didn't make Christmas delivery in time because of that. Whereas if I had just had a local provider who I could call ahead of the season and say, what's your plan? How are we gonna do this together? and have someone who actually said, here's the plan, here's the number of trucks, here's the time that they'll be there. These are, you know, your business means something to us. So it's very high stakes that we take care of you and you're not just another number that we don't care about. If I had that story ahead of the Christmas shipping season at DNA Footwear, I would have probably made, at hmm. least made a phone call mm -hmm. or at least opened that email. So that's my straw that breaks the camel's back story for a smaller distributor. You tell that story of somebody going through something and you, you, everybody has clients. You already yeah. have stories. You can just ask them. People forget to ask, why did you <laughs> buy from us today? <laughs> why did you hire me? Why did you bring me on this podcast? You know, uh, <laughs> we, we can just ask yeah, and we get great do. stories that way. Uh, and again, just, just going through that process. That's why you're on the podcast and that, answers the question. I think we've gone full <laughs> yeah. circle there because, because of that, you know, and, and, and a lot of people wouldn't connect those dots, which is, which is fantastic. It's on the, the story. On the flip side, communication's a two-way street. So how do we put this politely? How, how do we shut up and listen? What's the, so I'll, like, I'll have what a listen better this? workshop in December some of the most powerful listening tools that I have learned have come from theater. Okay. I mean, there's, there's adopt an attitude of curiosity um, is something that in general is nice to think about, except if you are not actually curious about who <laughs> you're talking to, it doesn't work and you come across as uh, <laughs> bored and inauthentic anyway. So it, it's, it's a nice idea, right? People want to come across as being present and interested. So a lot of people will teach you things like, 
facial expressions and body language. Make sure your arms aren't crossed. Unfurrow your brow, open your eyes, nod your head, smile from time to time. And then what happens is you look like a crazy person, first <laughs> of all, when you're doing these disconnected from any real, real feelings. And it's not sustainable and it distracts you from the actual moment. When you're too focused on your face to open mm -hmm. your ears, you're not listening. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe in any of those tactics and I don't coach to them. I don't help people with appearing to be present. I help them with actually being present. So finding the thing that you want to learn in a moment is much stronger than appearing curious. Reminding yourself to ask questions is not sustainable, but deciding what you might want to learn is a good way to put yourself into a listening space. Mm. And then to be reevaluating if you, if you can or can't learn that, if there's something else that's of value to you, if there's something else that might be interesting, you can ask a new question, you can, you can change what you're actually curious or interested in. But the, the tools from theater that are the most powerful for me come from Sanford Meisner, Sandy Meisner's technique, and also Uta Hagen's work. So the Meisner technique has this exercise you can do where you're repeating things until uh, the words no longer mean anything and you're really listening to what the person is giving you besides the words. And then you can ask a new question at that point. When you are really seeing what somebody is bringing to a conversation besides the words that they're sharing, you're really seeing their humanity. When you open your, your mind to the possibility that there is this miracle or beauty or love or God or whatever you believe in, in that other person, and you make it your mission to find it, see it, celebrate it, it keeps you present. But if you're waiting until the moment that they reveal it, then you're really responding in that moment to the most spectacular thing. And it's whatever they've given you. Like you've just given me a smile of recognition there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for people listening and you can hear it now, you can hear this little laugh. <laughs> um, that's that moment. I'm completely conscious of all these things right now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it's funny, like when I'm, when I'm listening to people, I'm always going off on tangents that, they, that I feel they have started. <laughs> and usually it gives us the, the outcome of this like incredible depth of connection. And I have to use my own method to keep us back on track. <laughs> I have to remember, wait, I had an objective for this. They have an objective for this. <laughs> Are we staying focused? Uh, but it is something that makes people feel heard when I ask them about a small thing that shifts in a moment. Mm -hmm. So instead of just the words, if you're listening for what else you're getting from someone, it keeps you present. And that's part of Uta Hagen's work too, in listening for intent. I think often we listen for content. We listen for what are the words that they say? How did they, you know, did they spell it right? <laughs> um, <laughs> did, they give an, did they provide an argument that I can counter? And so that puts us into this combative dramatic situation where we're not connecting, we're responding. Connecting, listening, being present, if you're listening for someone's intent, asking yourself, why did they choose to say that? Why did they choose, or, or why are they communicating to me the way that they are? Someone seems defensive, why? Hmm. Have I not created a safe space for them? Someone seems um, flippant, why? Is it actually not important to them? Or are they insecure about this topic? If they're insecure, can I help them get to a clarity where they might feel more confident? Or can I affirm some value in them that might make them feel more open to discussing it? So asking yourself why somebody is speaking as they are, instead of just thinking about what they're saying, mm -hmm. will keep you present as a listener too. So one thing I, I want to cover before uh, we move on to a couple of quick fire questions and, and, and wrap up is I suppose it's more prevalent now than ever, but we use a lot of different media to communicate. 
um, and <laughs> mainly digital at this moment in time and during 2020. But yes. let, 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 let's pretend that we do a lot of more face-to-face meetings and a lot more conversations happen in person than do right now. Do we need to change our style depending on the type of platform, say face-to-face, email, social, or should we try and uh, continue? I know from a personal branding point of view, it's important to have that consistency, but I'm also aware that if we were in face-to-face, our interaction would be slightly different. So do we change our style or or not? I think we automatically change our style. I think Mm -hmm. if you think about what content is more appropriate in one place or another, a book is a piece of content. Do you want to give people the entire book to read when they're at a library? Yeah. Do you want to give people the entire book to read when they've just come home after a very long day? No. Do you want to give people the entire book to read when they're scrolling social media? No. Do you want to give people the entire book to read when you're trying to get them to buy the book? No. (laughs) So it's, you know, when you think about where you are Mm -hmm. uh, and you imagine why someone else walked into that room, you can still be you, your tone can be the same, your personality can be the same, the information you have is the same, your tools are all the same, but the room has changed. So you have to ask yourself about that audience member's objective. Why did they walk into this room and what are they hoping to get out of it? What experience do they expect to have when they're here? Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are looking at an email and with very few exceptions, They're looking for something they can get super high value out of really fast before they delete it or move on to their next email that they actually have high stakes in responding to. So if you don't pack your emails with something fast, short, and high value, people will learn to delete them. They'll learn to stop walking into that room. Hmm. If they're on social media and you're saying the same kind of stuff that everybody else is saying, you're talking, um, maybe speaking in platitudes or sharing quotes by, you know, that somebody else said, you're not giving people a reason to listen to you and your voice. I see that a lot. You know, I see Mm. people saying, oh, well, it's easy to like a quote. Sure. Uh, But you're not giving people the opportunity to learn to enter your room and why. People can always enter Marilyn Monroe's room. She's all over the inter, you know, internet. But if you share a quote of hers, then they're still in her room. Hmm. So if you want people to remember why they should come to you, you have to show up with that thing appropriate to the room that you're in. So it might not change your style, but it'll change your focus, the length of what you say, um, how you deliver it. Like on Instagram, you want something that's visually impactful. On LinkedIn, you want something where the text is really the primary goal. Get them to read this. And then if they also watch the video, if they also look at the picture, great. But the text is of primary importance. In person, in real life, people are looking for much more of a volley, a back and forth, and Mm -hmm. even 50-50 talking and listening. So if that's the case, then you're looking for really short things that you can say so that someone else can come in sooner. Whereas on a podcast like this, when you're exploring something in depth and trying to give almost like a speaker value to the audience, uh, it might be different. But if you were Mm -hmm. here in my kitchen, we would probably go back and forth much faster. Right, okay, yeah. So, so I, I suppose in a way that if, if you're developing, well, whatever content it is, let's take a podcast, for example, if you mm-hmm. go down the route of interviewing people face to face, that may or, or will have a different tone and feeling potentially to one where it's online like it is today. It may, I think it's, but the, in that case, you still have the same audience. Mm-hmm. So the audience is still watching your interview at home. Mm-hmm. And, and we're creating this for them rather than for each other. Yeah. So when you're in person at, um, when you're in person at an event, let's say you're a panelist up on stage, you're, you're wanting to give room for the other panelists to also speak. Mm-hmm. You're wanting to call back to things that they said to reinforce those points and to help bring them in to support yours. But you're, you're sharing that space with these other people. And ultimately the audience are in front of you, the people who are listening to you, their questions might guide the content that you share. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do a panel that's pre-recorded, 
you don't have that live audience, so you're missing that spontaneity of redirection or application that, that is specific to the audience. So that changes, you know, being able to adapt and flow. But in person, I think we still have in-person conversations, you know, with whoever we live with or mm. people in the halls or the Instacart delivery driver or whoever it is, you know, whoever we can communicate with now we are. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in person though, and on video, we have the opportunity to respond to more things mm -hmm. people aren't saying, more of that listening for intent, more of that watching each other's bodies and faces and just mm -hmm. seeing what we see, what comes out. Cool, excellent, right, okay. Are you ready for some quick fire questions? I like to finish yeah, on quick fire it. questions, love it. Right, yeah. what was the last thing you remember Googling? I think I probably Googled the election results or the current count, you know, nothing exciting. <laughs> um, oh, and then and then right after that, I, I Google just to make sure that it was Sunday in the Park with George. That look I made a hat where I never made a hat of comes course, from a song yeah. called Finishing the Hat. Um, so I did just Google that too, <laughs> which Brilliant. is much more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I can't, I can't believe we didn't think of that straight off the bat. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's the most important thing to know about marketing right now? Marketing right now, marketing ever is your audience. Yes. You have to think about them and what they need and what they're looking for. Why do you love what you do? I don't know. I just <laughs> love it. <laughs> I think because I get to be myself and the things that I, that I happen to be strong in, that I also really love about myself, that I love doing, I get to do that now. I get to help people with things that I think are important. Communication is one of my top values. Community is one of my top values love and connection are you know my top values so the fact that my work that i'm strong in serves the values of things that are important to me mm. and i enjoy doing it i think it's a it's a pretty easy way to be happy with your work what a great what a great summary for life that is that's brilliant yeah <laughs> <laughs> final most important am I question a happy face or an unhappy face you know, <laughs> yeah and i, I Try to like do as many happy face things as I can and outsource the unhappy face things to someone Absolutely. else. Absolutely. Again, value right to the end. So final question, <laughs> if people want to find out more about you or, or your work and how you can unbelievably help them, where are you pointing them? Where should they go? Oh, just come to follow me on LinkedIn. It's a uh, Lila Smith, L-I-L-A-S-M-I-T-H. And you can also go to saythingsbetter.com. You can, if you're ready to work, work right now, then you can email Lila at saythingsbetter.com. But if you just want to maybe see what I'm up to, my profile summary on LinkedIn, my about section has links to whatever I've got coming up, uh, including all of my workshops that are pay what you want until the end of the year. Love it. Lila, thank you so, so much for doing this. Absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. You too. Thank you.